is the module 1 of the second unit which is all about fashion trims. In this unit we will define what fashion trims are. We will look at their categories, the materials in which they are made, their use and how to choose them for your particular design in garments and in accessories. Introduction In Unit 1, we have seen an introduction into the basics of fashion accessories and trims. The components or materials except the main fabric used in the production of garment and accessories like bags are called trims. They include sewing thread, button, zipper, velcro, label, shoulder pads, linings, interlinings, etc. Before we begin to understand the technicalities of these trims, I would like to list out what the objectives for this module are. To begin with, we would like to understand the fashion trims that are used in sewing garments and in accessories. We will attempt to define these trims and their features. We will understand the application of linings, interlinings and interfacings. We would discuss trims that are required for closure. We would also study the various types of zippers and buttons. We would study the need and the application of labels. We would also look at closures for accessories like velcro, buckles and eyelets. Before we delve deep into the world of fashion trims, here are a few terms that are worth knowing. Haberdashery Have you heard of this word haberdashery or notions before? These are terms that are used to describe small sewing supplies like buttons, zippers and collar stays. Over the passage of time, the terms also began to include small sewing tools like markers, seam rippers, pins, tapes and even sewing thread. The word haberdashery can be traced back to an Anglo-Norman French word hapeta meaning peddler of small articles or bits of fabric. A haberdasher is a peddler of needles, buttons and other sewing trims. However, the meaning of these terms is contextual and is dependent on the geographical location. In some countries, a haberdashery is a store where neckties or men's jackets could be sold. So what is the difference between haberdashery and sewing trim and notions? Sewing trims are trims and accessories that are used on the garment while it is being sewn. Sewing thread, elastic, interlining, lining, interfacing, zippers, ribs, pads and labels are commonly used sewing trims. In this unit, we will discuss each and every one of them in detail. So why do we need sewing trims? Sewing trims have multiple practical and aesthetic uses. Trims like interlining, pads and interfacing provide shape and stability to the garment and they also help make the garment more durable. Same in the case of accessories. Zippers act as fasteners working to close or open parts of a garment or accessory for easy use. Now compared to these trims, let us see what sewing accessories are. Sewing accessories are sewing notions or components or supplies that aid the sewing process. They help us in making the sewing process easier, precise and more comfortable. 
They include tools, attachments and supplies. There are five main categories of notions. These could be defined as various stages in making of the garment. As we know, to make a garment or an accessory, the first thing that we have to do is measurement. So the first category is of measuring. Once we have measured, we will do the marking for the pattern. So the second category is marking. Once the pattern has been made on paper, then it is cut. It is transferred to a fabric or a piece of leather or canvas depending on what is the final product and then that is cut as well. So the third category is called cutting. After this, if the fabric requires the interlining to be fused, pressing is done. This is done by applying heat and pressure to the fabric and the fusing combination. Finally, the last category is called sewing. This is where the actual production of the garment or the accessory happens. Here are a list of sewing accessories. Marker, a tailor's chalk or pencils that can be used for marking. Measuring tape and scale that is used for measuring. A seam gauge, sewing needles that help in precise sewing of the garment or the accessories. Bobbin and bobbin case that helps feeds the bobbin thread. Sewing machine attachments like zipper foot, hem folder etc. For instance, uh, to create a hem called a ball hem, a special zipper foot can be used. Now, what will we do without scissors and shears or seam rippers for instance? So these are materials that are very important in the list. Also, there are other smaller tools like a needle threader which help us thread the needle precisely. And then you have your pins that help hold your patterns in place while you are sewing. Moving on to fashion trims. Categories of fashion trims based on their usage. In unit 1, we discussed the different categories of fashion trims that are used in production. Trims that are used in making of apparel and accessories can be divided into three major categories. These are sewing trims, finishing trims and packaging trims. To recap what we already discussed in the first unit, sewing trims are those trims that are used during the sewing of a garment or an accessory. These include closure items like zipper, structure providing items like battings, pads and decorative items like ribbons, tapes or appliques. The main brand label that is attached to the product for primary branding and promotion also comes under sewing trims. Finishing trims are those trims that are used during the finishing of a garment or accessory. These include closure items like buttons and hooks and structure providing items like bones and stays. These can either be permanently fixed in the garment or they can be removed as in case of stays while washing or cleaning of the garment. Packaging trims are those trims that are used during the packaging of a finished garment or accessory. These include items like tissue paper, pins, boxes, tags, etc. Any promotional merchandise like tags, lookbooks, that is visuals of how the product looks when worn or how it can be used or the care manual all are used during this stage. These come under the category of packing trims. Sewing trims. 
Sewing trims are a way to elevate your design and make it truly special. They also aid the sewing process and add stability to your garments and accessories as we have seen before. Now let us do a categorization of these sewing trims. Sewing trims can be categorized based on whether they are visible or invisible which means that is hidden after the garment or the accessory is made. Visible trims Trims that can be seen from the outside of a garment or accessory. For example, sewing thread, buttons, velcro, zippers, etc. Decorative trims such as ribbons, tapes and laces also come under this category. And so do any applique patches. Sometimes lining is also used on the outside as a design detail. However, we will not discuss decorative trims at the moment, but we will explore them elaborately in the module 4 of this unit. So do watch out for that. Invisible trims. Invisible trims, as I mentioned before, are those that cannot be seen from the outside of the garment or accessory. For instance, interlinings, pads or stays come under this category. Now, let us take an example of this basic women's wear shirt. In this black shirt, you can see a collar. Now, how does this collar get the shape? And more importantly, how does it retain the shape? Now this happens because there is a material called interlining that is sandwiched between these two layers of fabric. Now this interlining could be a fusible or non-fusible. It could be woven or knitted or non-woven. We will discuss what these terms are and how they affect the performance of a garment when we come to the interlinings section of this module. Now, you can see that the main label of the garment is visible here. You can also see buttons that are visible. From this, we will be able to differentiate between what visible trims and invisible trims are. Now, both these categories of trims are highly important not just for the functionality of the garment but also for its aesthetics. Let us take a look at another garment, something that we all use and we love to wear. Yes, a pair of perfect blue jeans. So, when you take a look at a jean, how do you figure out if you like it or not? Yes. You do look at the color and you also do look at the fit. So what is very important for the fit? Yes, the way it is cut. But most importantly, how does the waistband function? For the waistband to function appropriately and in a way that makes you feel more comfortable, there is a button that is used for closure. This button is also known as a shank button. Now, underneath this button, in the fly placket, you also have a zipper. Typically, metal zippers or zippers with metallic teeth are used in denims. These make the garments highly durable. Now, are these the only trims that are there in this garment? No, not really. Before we go into invisible trims, there are other visible trims as well. For instance, the sewing thread. Typically, in denims, yellow or orange color sewing thread is used. This contrast provides an interest element to the jeans that you are wearing. Some brands also use red thread or black thread, depending
depending on their branding or design. Now let us take a look at these little things out here. What are they? They are called rivets. Usually your jeans will have rivets on its front pockets. Sometimes it will have those on the back as well. They can also be used for decorative purposes on the waistband over here or at the back. Now we have seen that it is a decorative function. But does it also have any practical use? Yes. This is a place in the garment where a pocket bag is attached and the waistband comes into play. Therefore, there are several layers of fabric being attached at this point. Only sewing is not going to make the garment durable. That is why we put a rivet at pocket openings to make sure that the sewing is safe and secure. This way, you can not only work in your jeans but also play and why not even sleep in them. Now, let us discuss each of these sewing trims beginning with the sewing thread. Sewing threads are special kinds of yarns that are engineered to pass through a sewing machine rapidly. They form efficient stitches without breaking or becoming distorted during the life of the product. The thread that is used to sew garments is often a polycore with a cotton top layer. In case of leather accessories such as bags or shoes, the thread may be made up of nylon. From this we can understand that the product, its design, its use and its aesthetics define the material of the sewing thread being used. The basic function of a thread is to deliver aesthetics and performance in stitches and in seams. Color, material, lustre and thickness of a thread must be taken into consideration while selecting the right sewing thread for production. Now, let me tell you a little story. The story of Coates and Clark. In 1812, the story of the cotton thread industry began in the town of Paisley, Scotland, where weavers had begun to reproduce the rare Kashmir shawls of India at unfortunately greatly reduced prices. Napoleon had blockaded Great Britain, stopping imported supplies including silk, which was necessary for the shawl industry in Paisley. Patrick Clark created a method of twisting cotton yarns together to produce a thread that was smooth and strong as silk that could be used by weavers. But it was soon discovered that it was strong enough to replace linen and silk thread for hand sewing. Patrick Clark and his brothers opened the first factory for making cotton and sewing thread in 1812. It was very successful in Europe and it was brought to America's shows where it was lapped up by those into the production of women's fashions. 1826, the Clark Mill was so successful in Europe that they started to export the yarn to other countries. It became extremely popular in America as well. In 1866, 
George Clark developed a soft finish thread first suitable for the sewing machine which revolutionized the thread industry. He called it our new thread which became known as ONT the famous trademark of the Clark Thread Company. Then the interests of Coates and Clarks were consolidated though both companies retained their separate identities until both the Clark Thread Company and J.P. Coates merged in 1952 to form Coates and Clark Inc. In the 1960s they continued their history of innovation with the development of a core construction creating a thread with a monofilament polyester core wrapped in cotton and they named it Dual Duty Plus. As home sewing machines and industrial machines became more advanced and we moved on to the 21st century, the company recognized a need for a thread which could be controlled to produce consistently smooth thread that resulted in better seams and highly durable fabrics and they introduced a product called Double Duty XP. If you would like to know more about the history of thread, I recommend that you read the following resources. Would you like to take a look at the inside of this beautiful book? Oh yes, it is made up of sewing threads of various interesting colors. Now let us look at one such spool of thread. Can you see how machine threads are evenly wound on a spool? If you look at the beginning of the thread and where to pull it apart, slightly untwisting as you go, you can see that it separates into two. Now this is why because it is created by using the process of twisting when the yarn is made. Commonly used twists in the yarn industry are Z-twist and S-twist. These depend upon the design of the thread, the engineering of the brand and the final requirement of the producer. Now that you have seen the history behind the sewing thread, I would like to talk to you about thread performance in garments. They can be evaluated from seam strength, abrasion resistance, elasticity, chemical resistance, flammability and color fastness. I know these might sound very technical to you almost like industry jargon. So I will take a moment to explain the requirements of a good quality sewing thread and why the above mentioned pointers are very important. A thread needs to have good tensile strength to hold the seam securely during wash and wear. Haven't you seen that in some garments especially those bought at clearance stores or even in street style shops the thread seems to come off even after a couple of washes now tell me what good is that a smooth surface of a thread ensures less friction between the needle and the material doing sewing it's extremely frustrating to start to sew a complex pattern and then to realize that your thread has snapped in between. You not only need to go back but also rip the thread from the fabric causing holes to form. Now why would we need all such a necessary mess? How can you solve this problem? The thread 
can be lubricated to decrease friction and avoid sewability. Uniform thickness and diameter of a thread is also important for the very same reason. It also affects the thread's tensile strength and resistance to abrasion. An uneven thread might twist into knots and jam at the eye of the needle. This you must have come across often when you are hand sewing and you are trying to pull a needle thread through a fabric and you see that it is knotted somewhere in between. Now a thread with good elasticity is very important not just in hand sewing but in machine sewing as well. When a thread is used in the sewing machine it undergoes a lot of tension. If the thread is elastic, it is able to come back to its original position immediately after the tension is released by the press of it. Now, color fastness is very very important. Imagine buying a beautiful white top with a red top stitch. You wear it for the first time and get loads of compliments. But then you throw it absentmindedly into the washing machine. The thread bleeds. The red color is all over your kurta. And then the only thing that is left is to dismantle or cut through the kurta and use the fabric for some other purpose or worse still throw it away. The thread used in sewing must be uniformly dyed and it should never bleed. This will ensure that there are no rejects, complaints or returns from the customer after the product is being bought and used. Low shrinkage reduces the chances of seam puckery. This ensures that you have beautiful flat seams. Good resistance to chemical attack is another desirable property, especially in wash and wear garments where we wash them in washing machines with detergents. Good abrasion resistance ensures a good sewing performance and makes the thread more durable. With this, we wrap up this section on sewing threads. Before we take a look at other visible trims that are used in garments and accessories. I would like to introduce a series of terms to you. First of the many is closure. Closure refers to the practice of closing the opening in a garment with an object known as a fastener. This is crucial in garments that have openings and cannot be left open. You see, for a garment to be wearable, it must have an opening. But sometimes it does not require a closure. For instance, a garment made up of a stretchable knit like a t-shirt can be worn through a neck opening. The kurta that I am ha wearing has a placket opening but it has no closure. Garments such as this kurta or a t-shirt can stay on the body without the opening being closed and hence they do not require closures. But not all garments are made that way. A trouser or jeans on the other hand or a shirt for even that matter has to be closed. So in that case a garment like a t-shirt or this kurta can be worn through the opening without the closure. Why? Because it stays put on the body without having to close it. While this is true of some garments, some others 
like skirts or jeans or trousers for that matter require a closure it has an opening by which it is worn but it needs buttons or zippers or drawstrings or sometimes a combination of these closures to close the opening as to enable it to stay on the body now apparel fasteners may be permanent or temporary permanent fastenings such as stitching and fusing create form and shape in tailored garments today garments are sewn together or stitched together with thread glue high tech devices heat or fusible substances temporary fasteners take many forms including basting used to hold fabrics in place before permanent machine stitching is applied now these are not the hardware that i mentioned at the beginning of this topic fasteners or fastenings are pieces of hardware that mechanically join or affix two or more objects together it can be used to join two or more surfaces in this case textile surfaces together fasteners have many uses fasteners such as hook and eye closure for bras can adjust the garment size a drawstring on a skirt waistband does precisely the same thing zipper fly front openings in men's trousers provide access for bodily functions closures are also essentials in accessories like bags or shoes lacing through grommets or eyelets is used in shoes and in corsets zippers are used in bags and press buttons are used in purses industrial trims like c clamps and d rings are also used in accessories all the time these trims can be used in garments as well as they provide function with unlimited options in form color and texture trims like zippers can be used purely for aesthetical purposes too buttons are another interesting trim to use in a garment openings and closures are decided not just based on design but on durability and practicality as well on clothing meant for upper body like blouses shirts or vests the closure is located at center front that is here center back or at the shoulder sometimes based on the design of the garment the opening can also be at the side in the front if you consider the traditional garments found in places like rajasthan and gujarat where men and women wear angharakas and angharakis you would see that the opening is there in the side sleeve openings are crucial for full shirt sleeves and those with a cuff sometimes sleeves also tend to be extended and have a lot of gathers here also an opening and a closure is required why because we want the gathers to fit close to the wrist and if we have to create an opening only for the size that is if the hem of the sleeve is only for the size it you might not be able to wear it you might not be able to put your hand inside that is why an opening needs to be created which can be fastened as soon as the sleeve is worn on clothing that is meant for the lower body like skirts and trousers the opening is located either at the center front waist or at the side some stylized pants may also have zipper openings at the hem churidars typically have press button 
or hook openings at the hem. Such openings enable the wearer to wear the garment easily and still get a close fit to the body. Now, let us discuss the placement of the openings in terms of socio-cultural reasons. Today, when we look at men's garments, especially a shirt, the button is almost always in the front. But it need not be so in a woman's wear garment. A shirt could have buttons in the front. A blouse or a dress could have an opening at the back with zipper and button closure or only button. Sometimes it could be just a high and hook. Now why are these changes? Is it only because of design? Is there a social aspect or a cultural aspect that is involved in it? Yes, my dear friends, there is a very interesting socio-political cultural context behind openings and closures as well. In the past, when a woman's garment had button openings at the back, it was felt as a showcase of wealth and power. Because when you have tiny button openings at the back, you cannot do or undo them by yourself. This means that you have people to help you with dressing. So having a maid or a stylist to help you while dressing was a show of power, might and wealth. Not all buttons and all closures are used only for practical purposes. They are used for decorative purposes as well. Raja Maharajas in India used to wear buttons of polki diamond, emeralds and rubies just to showcase their wealth. Even today, wedding wear sharwanis have zardozi embroidered buttons on them. While these are not the most practical form of closure because they tend to come apart after a couple of wears, they are there purely for aesthetic reason. They not only add value to the garment, they also add value to the look and to the person who is wearing them. Having a front opening in a woman's garment, for example, a hoodie with a zipper in the front, was also considered a sign of rebellion once upon a time. Having the ease to open or close your jacket or leave it halfway open meant that you were an independent, free-spirited woman who is not afraid of what the society thinks. Next time you buy or you wear a garment, I would like you to examine the opening that it has. Look for fasteners. Check to see what material they are made up of. Check to see whether they are useful, they are practical. Are you able to do and undo the buttons easily? Are you able to zip up and down quickly without the puller getting caught somewhere? Do you think the teeth of the zipper is durable? And the color has remained the same after all your wash and wear. Look through your wardrobe to find any articles of clothing that have decorative trims on them. Record all of these in your learning diary. This would be very useful to you when you design garments or accessories for yourself. Now let us take a look at different fasteners that are available. The list goes like this. In no particular order. Buckles. Snaps, also known as press buttons or press studs. Velcro tapes. In some countries, they are also known as hook and loop tapes. 
safety pins yes though they are only a temporary measure they are also a form of closure cufflinks now cufflinks fall under the category of fashion trims accessories as well as jewelry not many trims can boast of having the status brooches and items like fibula have been used in the ancient past for fastening in the modern period zippers are something that we cannot do without blouses have hook and eye closure frog fasteners or rosette and loop fasteners can be commonly found on china inspired attire toggle fasteners are another interesting fasteners that can be found in rustic earthy looking garments metal fasteners are also used these days grommets and eyelets are another important closure now press buttons shank buttons grommets eyelets these are all trims that you will find not just in garments but in accessories like bags and sometimes even footwear now i cannot conclude this list without mentioning two very important fasteners one is cord cord rope tape ribbon laces they have all been used throughout ages as some form of fastening last but not the least are buttons buttons come in various forms and in various formats they can be made up of different materials they can be made up of plastic or shell or wood or horn they can be two hole or four hole they can be a shank button or a press button or a flat button more about them later now if i ask you to tell me a name of a fashion trim a practical trim that you cannot do without i am very sure that many of you would say zipper a trim that is valuable today a trim that is irreplaceable in the fashion industry was not a very old invention the precursor to the zipper the automatic continuous clothing closure was created only in 1851 by elias hobb who received a patent for it now fast forward to 1893 when the inventor of a pneumatic street railway whitcom l jackson of chicago created the clasp locker or the hookless fastener if i ask you to name one practical fashion trim that you cannot live without i think most of you would say zipper from our hoodies to jeans from bags to wallets zips are everywhere today can you imagine a world where a zipper did not exist well the precursor to the zipper the automatic continuous clothing closure was created only in 1851 by elias hau who received a patent for it fast forward to 1893 when inventor of the pneumatic street railway whitcomb l jackson of chicago created the clasp locker or the hookless fastener Judson's invention debuted at the 1893 Chicago World Fair but he unfortunately never found a use for it and it did not come into the market as the most useful trim that we know today now all this changed with Gideon Sunback of the goodridge rubber company who modified judson's gadget increasing the number of fastening devices 
or teeth as we call them today per inch. Sunback's new and improved system increased the number of fastening elements from 4 per inch to 10 or 11 and had two facing rows of teeth that pulled into a single piece by a slider. He also increased the opening for the teeth guided by the slider. His patent for the separable fastener was issued in 1917. Then the Goodrich company put them on rubber boots and called it a zipper for its zip sound. In 1925, the Scott Leather Company put a zipper on the instantly iconic Perfecto jacket and the fasteners practical application took off. During the 1930s, ad campaigns for children's clothing hailed zippers as a self-reliance teaching tool among children, empowering them to dress themselves. Later, Esquire magazine declared zipper the newest tailoring idea for men. With such a colourful past, zippers became a very important part of our society and a crucial component of the fashion industry. Now moving on to the technical side of things. What are the different types of zippers? Now zippers can be classified based on materials. Metal. Metal zipper is the most basic original zipper that was first produced. Today, metal zippers can be divided into two groups depending on the materials used and the process of manufacture. In one category, zippers where the teeth form from metal wire either flat or profiled and is made from brass, aluminium, nickel or cupronickel, sometimes even nickel-free options. In the next category, teeth is die cast directly into the tape with zinc metal. You will see metal zippers or at least zippers with metallic teeth commonly used in denim garments. They are also popular fixtures in bags. Now looking at a zipper, you can see that it has three main parts. One is the teeth or the row of teeth. Second important component is the puller that goes up and that goes down. And third is the locker at the end. This is also referred to as the stopper in certain countries. Metal zippers are usually made in a variety of finishes such as golden brass, antique brass, antique silver, gunmetal or silver etc. These finishes are achieved by chemical treatment of the zipper chain and matching plating of the sliders and the end stops. The next category of material which is most commonly used in the fashion industry is that of molded plastic. Initially known as nylon zippers, plastic zippers have individually injected molded teeth fused directly onto the tape of the zipper. The high performance resins used to manufacture molded plastic elements are incredibly strong and make these zippers durable, very strong and yet flexible. These zippers are ideal for outerwear and heavyweight garments. Some, sometimes they can be used for indoor garments as well. Now, zippers can be categorized also based on form. Open-ended zipper. Some zipper applications require a zipper to detach completely. Example, a jacket or a hoodie. Instead of a fixed bottom stop or a box and pin attachment is used. This 
ensures that the zipper is open ended closed ended regular zippers now these kind of zippers if you notice this is the front and this is the back there is a metal stopper at the back which acts as a crimp in the front there are also stops on the top this is a regular zipper that you would see in most garments purses and bags these closed end zippers are non separating and are normally open and closed with a slider the bottom stop is made up of a single part and doesn't allow complete separation of the chain open ended separating zippers have separate ends the ending part here is joined by a box and pin mechanism provided on the lower end of the zipper first you need to lock the zipper fix the slider onto the other side of the teeth and then pull the zipper up this is commonly used in outerwear jackets and hoodies two way separating zippers have separated ends as well the bottom slider allows movement from the bottom of the zipper these are used in rainwear sportswear and sometimes products like sleeping bag two way head to head zipper has two sliders at the center of the chain where the zippers are closed head to head zippers can be opened by pulling the slider towards the stop but cannot be separated because the ending parts have two stops that cannot be divided these zippers are mainly used for bags backpack and luggage also another kind of zipper known as an invisible zipper these kind of zippers are usually used in highly fashionable ladies clothing like blouses and dresses if you look at a regular zipper when zipped up the teeth are visible this is not considered to be an attractive feature in high end designer wear often when such zips are used in a garment a concealing placket is also sewn so that the garment looks almost seamless looks like it does not have a hardware closure on it but often this is not possible and there is another feasible way of doing this it can be done using the invisible zipper once zipped up the teeth are not visible and it is sewn in such a way that probably 1 or 2 mm of the zip is what is visible on the outside which is almost barely not there when you open the zip you can see the teeth on the back side you can see that it has to be slightly unfurled for it to be sewn on a garment the sewing process of the concealed zipper is slightly more complicated compared to the regular zipper that is why you will not find it on your bags or pouches you might not even find it on the garments made by your local tailor but when it comes to highly fashionable garments that require a seamless look a concealed zipper is most recommended now you might ask me why should a zipper not be visible a very good question indeed if you want your zipper to be a design aspect of your garment or your accessory by all means flaunt it now flaunting a zipper is not only to show its teeth but also to show the tape on which the zips are fixed look at these two fancy zippers this one is called a spotted zipper or a polka dotted zipper and this zipper has a hound's tooth pattern on it usually these kind of zippers are sewn on solid color accessories or garments so you sew them not like you sew the normal zippers close to the teeth but slightly away so that the pattern is visible 
these can also be fixed as a pleeks onto a garment if you so decide as a design feature. Now, if you look at this particular zip from coats, you can see that it has a tag. The tag says closed bottom. So you can see that this bottom has a metallic crimp on it. It cannot be cut, though it can be removed using pliers. This is provided so that this zip can be used on highly durable, high performance accessories where zipping has to be durable. A zipper like this with a metallic crimp is created for high performance accessories like luggage bags where you need the zipper to work consistently even after many years of purchase. We just talked about how zipper teeth being visible is not a very attractive feature. But what if not just the teeth but also the tape has a pattern on them? This particular zipper has a hound's tooth pattern on the tape. When opened, these have chunky plastic teeth. After zippers, the next fastener that we are going to study about is hook and loop fastener, commonly known as Velcro. Velcro, as you all might have seen, is a typical sneaker, a shoe or a sandal fastener. It was invented in 1951 by Swiss engineer George de Mestre. After some trial and error, the Mestrel settled on nylon and was granted a patent for his fastener in 1955. NASA first used it in their spacesuits. Then skiers and scuba divers applied it to their suits for a tight, water and wind resistant seal. It is also extensively used in medical expeditions and by the army. It is also worn as closure in garments by performance artists who need to wear or remove items of clothing in seconds during or in between their performances. Despite its functions and its usability, Velcro is not considered to be a high fashion fastener. Moving on, let us look at some of the oldest fasteners that have been used. Buckles, D-rings and O-rings. A buckle or a clasp is a device used for fastening two loose ends. One end is attached to the buckle and the other end is held by a catch in a secure but adjustable manner. The buckle essentially comprises of four components, the frame, the chap, the bar and the prong. The word buckle has its roots in the Latin buccula or cheek strap which alludes to the straps that the Roman soldiers used to keep body armour and helmets in place. Early buckles were purely functional and were used almost exclusively by the military. They also paved way for strategic and military innovations. The buckle was integral to the construction of a baldric, a leather belt slung diagonally across the shoulder and used to carry a sword more comfortably. Today, buckles are primarily found on belts, bags and coats. They are favoured for the range of sizing options that they allow. A buckle today could be casted from metal or resin or even plastic for that matter. There are designer buckles that are available out of glass, crystal, even wood buckles 
that provide design relief as well as closure. Buckles can be ornamented with patinas, paint, rhinestone or several finishes that add more value to them and to your look when you are wearing them. A buckle and the belt along with it can define how your waist looks like. The other components in this category are D-rings and O-rings. They are industrial trims that are often used in back construction, even garments as connectors of tape or cord. Other fasteners such as buttons, snaps, hook and eye, toggle, frock closure and cords are all attached to the garment or the accessory after sewing during the finishing stage and hence will be discussed under finishing trims in the next module. Moving on, let us discuss lining and interlining as the next sewing trim. Interlining is a layer of material between the outer fabric and the lining. It is usually included to give the garment additional warmth, provide structure and stability as well. Interlining can be removable or a permanent part of the garment. Examples of synthetic interlining include primer loft and thinsulate. Flannel, fleece, cotton batting, chamois, horse hair can also be used as interlining. Lining, on the other hand, is a smooth fabric that is used in the inner face of the body to provide extra protection to the garment. It can also be used to finish the edges and add value at the point of sale. Blazers often come with a contrast lining. For instance, a blazer aimed at the youth could have stripes, polka dots or printed satin lining. In ladies wear, cotton is often used as a lining material. This enables the wearer to wear fabric such as brocades, even in summer. Not to be confused with lining is underlining. Now underlining is a fabric that is added to the fashion fabric that is the shell fabric for more body or opacity. Imagine that you are using a fabric like tulle which is transparent or chiffon. It needs to have some sort of of an underlining on the inside if you were to make the fabric look opaque. Now underlining is a separate layer attached to the corresponding garment fabric section on the wrong side and then treated as one during construction. Pattern markings are often transferred to the underlining when using very expensive show through fashion fabrics. The next component in this section is interfacing. Interfacing is a structural material placed between fabric layers in areas where more stability, body and support are needed beyond the thickness of the shell fabric itself. When I showed you the jeans or the formal shirt previously, I talked about the collar having stiffness or the waistband retaining its shape. Now this is due to the interfacing that has been used inside the layers of fabric during construction. What can we understand from this? 
it is common for interfacing to be found in collars, cuffs, facings, front openings that is even under buttonholes and sometimes in hems or entire garment fronts or upper backs as in tailored garments like the suits. Woven interfacing fabrics need to be pre-shrunk. The purpose of this technique is to eliminate bubbling and distortion caused by shrinking after the construction process. Non-woven interfacings, however, do not need to be pre-shrunk. Let us look at the purpose of interfacing more elaborately. The purpose of interfacing is to stabilize fabric, preventing stretching and sagging. It is also used when you need to customize seams that are crisp and sharp. Interfacing is used to reinforce areas where buttons, buttonholes or other fasteners are sewn. This adds body to the shell fabric and helps support the weight of other finishing trims. Interfacing is used to support facings and other garment details. It stabilizes necklines and waistbands. You might have seen interesting necklines in ladies' kurtas, blouses and tops. How are these interesting necklines created and how do they stay in shape even after wearing and washing them? The interfacing inside them does the trick of keeping the shape in place. It also helps the garment to hang properly on the body without any sagging. It leaves a crisp look. On the other hand, interfacing can also be used to soften edges like for instance round cuff in a full hand shirt. It gives smooth, firm body as in case of suits and blazers. It helps provide shape to areas such as shoulders, hems, collars and cuffs. Aren't you interested in interfacing now? There are a variety of interfacings that are available in the market. They are constructed differently and meant for different end uses. Let us attempt to study this categorization, mainly beginning with the construction of interfacing. There are three basic interfacing types, woven, non-woven and knitted. Woven interfacings such as this have straight and cross grain just like any woven fabric. They must be cut on the same grain. They can be cut on bias for stretch. Non-woven interfacings are made by bonding or felting fibers together, creating a mesh without any visible direction. Unlike wovens, they do not ravel, but they tend to be a less supple. For instance, this interfacing that you see is almost like a thick piece of cardboard. This is primarily an adhesive based interfacing, which means that you can use this to join two pieces of fabric together without sewing. This kind of interfacing is used primarily in home decor projects. It can also be used in accessories like hats where regular cleaning or washing is not required. Knit interfacings are usually soft and flexible and stretch crosswise but only slightly in the lengthwise direction. Weft insertion interfacing is also knitted though it then has additional threads passing through the fibers to add more stabilization needed for tailored garments. Now let us look at attachment methods 
as a type of categorization of interfacings. Fusible and SUN are two types of interfacings that are used commonly while sewing. SUN interface provides a softer finish for the garment while fusible interfacing provides a slightly crisper result. Fusible interlining such as this can be identified by a shiny surface on one side. It has an adhesive dot coating on the wrong side that is this side and a fabric like feeling on the opposite side as it is a woven fusible interfacing. This adhesive is activated by heat to bond it to the fabric. Sewing interfacing remains separate from the actual garment or project being only caught in the construction seam lines. Now let us move on to seeing what are the types of fusible interfacings that are available in the market. Types of fusible interlinings are PVC coated interlining, PVA coated interlining, polyethylene coated interlining, polyester coated interlining, polyamide coated interlining and polypropylene coated interlining. Regardless of which fusible and which machine is used, fusing is controlled by four processing components. They are temperature, time, pressure and cooling. The temperature of fusing must be maintained from the beginning to the end. This is why time is very important. Pressure is another crucial component when it comes to fusing. Sometimes when we iron fusing at home using our iron boxes, we tend to move the iron horizontally on the surface as we would iron out a crease. But this method is wrong. It is preferable that you use a heavy iron while pressing the fusing. That is, press the fusing until it adheres and move to the next spot instead of ironing. Just as heat is important, cooling is also important in fusing. If the garment or the fabric is sewn without cooling the fabric, then the results will not be desirable. Now that we have seen that there are so many types of interfacing available in the market, how do we go about selecting the right interface? The selection of the interface should depend upon the weight of the fabric on which it's applied to. Using a heavy interfacing on a light fabric can weigh it down. Now, this property can also be used when you need to weigh down a fabric. Traditionally, light color fabrics use a light color interfacing and vice versa. The color of the interfacing should not in any way affect the color of the fashion fabric or the outer fabric when placed underneath it. In some instances where sheer fabrics are used, a second or a third layer of shelf fabric may be the best choice for an interfacing to prevent show through or any significant color change while using a traditional fusing. Now, some fabrics cannot be used with fusible interfacings. For example, metallics or any fabric that has a coating. These would get affected by the heat. Also, nap fabrics such as velvet, where heat or even the shape of the iron would leave a mark cannot be used with a fusible interfacing. In these cases, opt for a sew-in interfacing. More than anything else, 
please read interfacing care instructions as and when they are bought from the manufacturer. This will tell you all the details that you need to know about the temperature, pressure, time and cooling that you need to know in order to create a desirable bond. In case such advice is not available, it is prudent to try or test out samples before you actually move on to the final product. Now let us discuss fabrics and interfacings a little more. Featherweight or midweight sewing interfacing can be used for thin lightweight fabrics such as voile or chiffon. To add stability to detail areas, buttonholes, collars, waistbands and facings, crisp fusible is required. Weft insertion interfacing can be used to tailor midweight jackets of wool and wool blends. For crisp collars and cuffs in shirts of poplin, chambray and linen, non-oven fusible can be used. Fusible fleece adds low loft body to craft home decor, quilt, handbags and totes. Remember, buckram is not the only fusible that is available and heavyweight fusings should be used in products such as home decor, curtains where you need weight at the end of the curtain. With that, we come to the end of the topic on linings, interlinings and interfacings. Let us look at some more sewing trims that are available in the market and that are used in apparel production. Elastic. Elastic is a trim I am sure many of you would be familiar with. As children, we would have all worn elasticated skirts or trousers and even today, many pyjamas, leggings have elastic in the waistband. Now what is elastic? Elastic is a term used to describe narrow fabrics incorporating elastomeric fibers which extend when stretched and recover their original dimension when the stretching is ceased. Elastics are broadly used at the waist of skirts, pyjamas, briefs, lingerie such as bras and many other garments. The size of elastic is expressed by their width. They might be half an inch to one inch 2 inches or even more. Bobbin elastic is a kind of elastic that can be used in as bobbin thread while sewing. The next trim on our list is shoulder pads. Shoulder pads are type of fabric covered padding used to give the wearer the illusion of having broader and less sloping shoulders. In men's styles, shoulder pads are often used in suits, jackets and overcoats. They are usually sewn at the top of the shoulder and fastened between the lining and the outer fabric. In women's clothing, their inclusion depends upon the current fashion. For instance, in 80s, when power dressing was in trend, shoulder pads were all the craze. Shoulder pads will be necessary for a suit or a blazer in order to compensate for certain fabrics natural properties where the weight of the material is less or whereas they are drooping down. Shoulder pads were particularly popular during 1940s 1980s, late 2000s and 2010s. Other kinds of pads 
that can be used during garment sewing are bust pads or bosom pads. Padding is typically done in blouses or cholis as cups to create blouses that have very no necklines. These blouses can be worn without an additional bra as the cups used support the bus. Cups such as these are also used in designer dresses, backless dresses, dresses with straps often take advantage of these pads. Rarely, pads are also used to pad up the exterior. These pads were used at the end of the 19th century to create a pigeon look. The last category of trim that we are going to discuss in sewing trims are labels. You must have seen labels in every garment that you buy. Label is a tag that gives a description. It could be a brand label that talks about who designed or made the garment. It could be a part of the garment that indicates various instructions about the garments. It can be attached by sewing or sometimes even by riveting. There are different types of labels that are used in the production of apparel and accessories. Main label. In a garment, the main label is often sewn at the inside at center back. It contains the name of the brand or the designer that you are buying it from. This little piece of fabric is very very important as it is the first communication about the brand at the point of sale. In a bag, this label could be placed near an inside pocket or just below a zipper opening. It can also be sewn on the side seam and visible outside. The next most important type of label in apparel is the size label. The size label often tells us what is the size of the garment. It is used right alongside the main label. It can also be used on the underside of the main label if the designer wants to save up space. Also, not many customers like wearing garments that have too many labels at the neck. It can be itchy and make the wearer feel uncomfortable. One of the most important labels in accessories like bags, belts and apparel is the care label. This provides us information about taking care of the product. Information regarding washing, ironing, drying are all given here. In the case of accessories like jewelry, labels cannot be attached to the main product. They are often given as tags. These are attached in the finishing stage or in the packing stage after the piece has been made and while it is being packed. There is also a fourth kind of label. This is called integrated label. It contains the main label, care label and size label in combination. There is also one more type of label called contents label. A crucial label in the food industry. It is often combined with a material label or the wash care label in the garment industry. Now, 
I would like to show you a collection of brand labels or main labels that I have. These are labels that are primarily used for branding. You would have seen labels such as this attached to shirts and suits. You can see them containing the brand logo as well as the name of the brand. The word mark or the trademark of the brand is also mentioned here. These labels all have something in common. They are woven labels as you can see from the back. You can see some more interesting labels here. These are folded labels. For instance, they are folded and sewn. They are attached at this point to the facing or the binding at the neck. These are single layer labels where it is sewn on all four sides to the back yoke. These are smaller labels that perform the same function. Labels such as this are only sewn on the side and not on all four sides. You would have seen labels such as this on shirts and t-shirts. This label is folded on both sides to get a trapezium like shape and this part that is extra goes into the binding or the facing. Thereby the stitch here is not visible. Here are more labels for you to look at. Brand labels can be in multiple colors. They can be printed or woven. These are some kids wear labels that you can see here. You can also see that labels come in a variety of shapes. They can be rectangular, they can be square. These are some examples of embossed labels. These are examples of labels where the text has been embossed using the particular weaves. This is a back side of this label. These are labels that have glitter on them. You would have seen labels such as this on t-shirts. Some of these are sewn while others are heat pressed to the fabric. You can see that these labels also perform functions as patches and thus they are not the main label but decorative labels and patches used for additional branding and promotion. You can see more main labels here. You can see a variety of techniques of glitter, of sparkle, of matte finishes and of an embroidery sort of a technique here. You can also see different textures, satin smooth, ribbed and different textures on the label. These are some examples of printed labels. I showed you an example of Bob the Builder as an oven label before. Now these labels are much more thinner. Many consumers who wear t-shirts or shirts with such labels at the back complain that they cause itching or that, that they are very heavy. So printed labels remove the additional bulk thereby causing the label to be super smooth. You can also see here that this main label comes along with the wash care label. This is another example of this label. You can also see here that the content 
of the fabric being used is mentioned in the main label. From this, you can come to a conclusion that design of the main label depends upon the brand and differs from product to product. What do you want to convey? Is it only the main brand logo or the content, the size and the wash care as well? It is up to you as a designer and a manufacturer to decide. Wash care labels form an important category under labels. We all love bright bold colors in our clothing. Color is beautiful until it fades and then it becomes a detestable piece of fabric. Following the right wash care instructions or care instruction label on your product can go a long way in saving you the heartache. The first step to understanding these wash care labels is to understand what the symbols on them mean. On the screen you can see some commonly found symbols on a wash care label. A symbol that looks like a bucket with water stands for wash. Can the product be washed? Is it machine washable? These are the kind of instructions that are provided under this label. The second one, which is a triangle, stands for a bleach. Triangle with a cross means do not bleach. In some cases, this can use to represent a fabric softener also. The last symbol that you see here, that is a square, corresponds to drying. When you have a circle within a square, it refers to tumble drying. Naturally, a square, a circle and a cross means do not tumble dry. The next category on the wash care label that looks like an iron box refers to ironing. The dots act as modifiers. They could represent heat or temperature while one dot means 110 degree centigrade two means 150 sometimes labels will also have instructions like dry away from direct sunlight jewelry my snack this fabric immediately launder garment should spillages occur Avoid contra contact with abrasive surfaces. Wash separately in cool water. Now, the final component that we are going to discuss today is that of dry cleaning. Dry cleaning is represented by a circle. Sometimes you will see letters like P or F on top of it. What does it mean? F refers to petroleum solvent only, whereas P refers to any solvent except trichloroethylene. Following these instructions on the wash care label is crucial to increase the durability of the garment. As a designer and a manufacturer, you must understand the properties of the fabric and suggest a suitable wash care label to be attached to your garment while it is being manufactured. In case of most accessories and jewelry, care labels will usually come with a statement spot clean only. It means that they must not be washed. Products such as leather are sometimes cleaned with kerosene or other petroleum products. While this sounds like a handy solution, it does not work on all types of leathers or accessories. 
it is be prudent to check your care label that comes with your product on the type of cleaning or caring that must be used for a particular product. to the end of this first module of unit 2. Let us summarize the points that were discussed. Fashion trims are those supplementary materials that are used in the manufacture of a garment or accessory other than the main material. They are used to increase the wearability, value, strength and shape of the garment or its components or the accessories. In this unit, we discussed sewing trims in detail. We found that sewing trims can be visible or hidden. They can be both functional or decorative. In the process of reading about these trims, we also saw what closure was and how important fastenings are to not just design and the wearing of the garment but also to its durability. We looked at fasteners such as zippers in detail. We discussed the different types of zippers that are available in the market and how, where and why they are used. We also looked at other trims like elastic, pads and buckles. We explored in depth hidden trims such as linings, interlinings, underlinings and interfacings. We saw what fusible and sewing interfacings are. I hope that this section would have also given you some tips on choosing the right interfacing for your future products. In conclusion, I would like to restate the importance of fashion trims in accessories and in apparel. Selecting the right trim can go a long way in making the production process easier they can make the product more durable and can also add aesthetic value to your product. This is the module 2 of second unit which is all about finishing trims. In this module we will list the trims that are added to the garment or accessory after sewing and during finishing like buttons and hooks. Introduction In module 1, we have seen the classification of fashion trims and accessories into sewing, finishing and packaging trims. In this module, we will attempt to understand the fashion trims that are used in finishing. We will attempt to categorize buttons based on design, material, use and size. We will study the application of other finishing trims like hooks, boning and stays, rivets and cords. Before we delve deep into the technicalities of finishing trims, we must first understand what does the finishing process entail. Garment finishing. Garment finishing is the last stage in apparel production. Here, the stitched garments go through phases of washing, if it is a wash garment, post sewing trimming, 
It undergoes buttoning and buttonhole making, which is known as button attachment, thread trimming, cleanup, and quality check. After this, the garments are totaled, audited, and checked for quality. Later, they are ironed and packed. We will discuss the trims that are used during packing in the next module. In case of accessories, the process is very similar. While there might not be a washing process, other stages like buttonhole attachment, buttoning, thread cutting, auditing, totaling remain the same. Now coming to finishing trims, what are they? Finishing trims are those trims that are used during the finishing of a garment or accessory. These include closure items like buttons and hooks and structure providing items like boning and stays. In the last module, we have discussed the need for having opening and closures using fasteners or fastening. I had also mentioned that we will discuss buttons, hook and eye separately in this module. Let me now list some of these finishing trims. They are in no particular order, rivets, hooks, eyelets, buttons, stays and wires, boning, stoppers and drawstring. Let us start this module by understanding components like rivets. Rivets are a two-part metal component that are widely used for both decorative and reinforcement that is support purposes. In the last module, I had shown you a sample of denim jeans where I pointed to you that rivets are being used to reinforce the openings of the pockets that is the front pocket of the jeans. You would have also seen rivets used for decorative purposes on back straps and on purpose. While rivet is a no sew mechanism, it can be combined with decorative stitching, top stitching, taping and other cords to make it into an aesthetic feature. The second trim that we are going to discuss is hook and eye closure. Hook and eye closure is a clothing fastener that consists of two parts, each sewn into respective pieces of cloth. On one side, you have a small protruding blunt hook and the other with a small eye. Now, these two components could both be metal or the hook component which functions like this and a loop component that functions like this. The hook could be metal and the loop or as it is referred to as the eye could be made up of thread. To fasten the garment, the hook is slotted into the loop either like this with a hook facing upwards or like this with a hook facing downwards. Now the placement of whether the hook is facing upwards or downwards depends upon the brand, the designer, the design, the practicality and the place on which the hook and eye are placed in the garment. Hook and eye closure are commonly used in blouses, bras and corsets. In bras and corsets, several rows of hooks can be found. This is for size adjustment. While not patented until 1900, the hook and eye as we know today was created during the 19th century 
by Richardson and DeLong Hook and I Company of Philadelphia. A small bump called the DeLong Hump was added to the wire hook to prevent the eye from slipping out, resulting in a more secure closure. As with many other metallic trims, it is also important to note the material of the hook. It should not corrode and it should resist wear and tear and repeated washings. So materials like stainless steel are preferred when creating hook and eye. The third trim that we are going to discuss today falls under the category of eyelets and grommets. Now these two words are often used interchangeably in the fashion industry. However, there exists a small difference between them. In the fashion industry, eyelets are rings that are inserted into holes of textile materials to reinforce the hole. They are especially useful in cases where a hole is punched in a hard material, leaving sharp or uneven edges that could later tear or fray. It is always used to increase the stability when ropes or cords need to be passed through the hole. Eyelets are frequently used in shoes and in corsets to pass lacing, cording or ribbons through it. Apart from metal eyelets which are commonly found, they can also be made of rubber, plastic and metals like brass or stainless steel. It could be made up of a plethora of other materials. Now, as discussed in the Abba Hukana example, the material of eyelet must be taken into consideration while you select them. Materials like steel and aluminium degrade when brought into contact with water. To avoid this problem, stainless steel, nickel or brass is recommended. However, brass too tends to oxidize with time. Grommets have larger flanges and diameters when compared to eyelets. Grommets are typically used for heavy fabrics such as tents, sails, tarps or flags. They are also used in banners. But they can in smaller sizes be used in shoes and corsets in the clothing industry. Grommets can be found on drapes and curtains. And heavier fabrics that are used to hold rings that slip through metal rods. Grommets can be metal, plated metal. These days you also get decorative grommets in hard plastic. The next trim that we are going to discuss is button. In fashion, a button is a small plastic or metallic disc or sometimes a knob-shaped object usually used to secure an opening or for ornamentation. Functional buttons work by slipping the button through a fabric or a thread loop or by sliding the button through an in reinforced slit called a buttonhole. Buttons today are considered kitschy. They are an embodiment of pop culture. Contrast buttons are used to add a lot of flavor to plain solid garments. But do you know how and since when buttons are being used? In ancient China, India and Rome, buttons were used as ornamental details rather than as fasteners. They were carved from seashells and stones. 
the earliest known button has been found at Mohenjo-daro and is said to be 5000 years old. Early buttons were crafted by artisans from a range of luxury materials. Porcelain, lacquer, rubies, emeralds and diamonds and even painted portrait miniatures were handmade into buttons. The medieval period was the era when wearing lots of buttons meant big money. Some would also pay off debts by simply plucking a button from the garment and giving it to their money lender. Italians still describe the rooms where powerful leaders meet as Tanse de Botany, which means a room of buttons. But functional buttons did not pop up until the 13th century. In 13th century Germany and by the start of 14th century, functional buttons were widely used across Europe. This was due to the popularity of tight-fitting clothing. The Victorian Tushimushi buttons pictured tiny bouquets whose flowers held symbolic messages. Queen Victoria donned mourning buttons of carved black jet upon her husband Prince Albert's death. She kicked off a fashion among bereaved button wearers throughout the empire. Today, buttons are manufactured from an extremely wide range of materials, including natural materials such as antlerbone, horn, ivory, shell, vegetable ivory, or tagua, and wood, or synthetics such as celluloid, glass, metal and even plastics like Bakelite which are today vintage collectible buttons. Hard plastic is by far the most common material followed by metal and wood in buttons that are available in the market today. Now let us understand how buttons can be classified. Buttons can be classified in various types. Now they can be classified according to the number of holes. Flat buttons will either be two hole or four hole buttons. When sewing them onto the garment, the hole placement and the stitching can be used to create decorative features. You can also classify a button based on whether it is a sewing button or a non-sew button that is by the way in which it is attached to the fabric be it apparel or accessory. Examples of non-sew buttons include stud buttons and snaps. They can also be classified according to the material. Natural and synthetic, printed, striped or solid, hand painted, embroidered or stone encrusted. In plastics, polyamides and polyesters are commonly used. Other buttons can be made up of metal, wood, chalk etc. Finally and most importantly, button can be classified according to size. Now you might ask me, yes we can see that shirt buttons are of two different sizes. The button in the front placket opening is of a particular size, whereas ones on the collar and cuff are much smaller. Now buttons on kids wear garment tend to be bigger. Jacket buttons are even bigger than that. So is there 
any unit of measurement for these buttons? Yes, there is. Buttons are measured using the unit called line. Spelled L-I-G-N-E. Line is a measuring unit of a button's diameter. One line is equivalent to approximately 1 40th of an inch or 0 0.025 inches. Line 40 or 40L is equivalent to 1 inch. Now I would like to walk you through a button size conversion chart. Here we would see the line size of a button and its corresponding size in millimeter and inches. Now let me introduce you to a few commonly used button sizes. 12L or 8mm button which is 5 by 16th of an inch is what you find mostly on shirt collars and cuffs. 16L 10mm button or 3 by 8th of an inch can be found on most formal wear shirts and sometimes casual shirts too. The size 24L which corresponds to 15mm is the most commonly used button size in the fashion industry. As mentioned before, 40L equals 1 inch. Now button sizes can typically go up to 2 inches. Buttons are bought and sold in grosses. One gross equals 12 dozens, that is 12 into 12. One grand gross is equal to 12 into 12 into 12, 1728 pieces. Buttons can be dyed. These plain buttons are often mentioned as DTM or dyed to match. When the designer gives a specification sheet, solid buttons are dyed to match the exact color of the yarn that is being used in the garment. This process is usually followed in ready-to-wear industries like shirt producing units. Now, let us take a look at types of buttons based on their forms. I love going to haberdashery stores and looking at all the buttons that are available. There are so many materials, colors, forms and types to choose from. But when I'm selecting a button for a design, how do I know that I'm choosing the right button? Before I even consider that application, I have to first understand what are the types of buttons available with regard to form and function. That is exactly what we are going to be discussing now. Types of buttons. Firstly, flat buttons. These are the simplest of all buttons and they are fairly flat with two or four holes in the center. Sometimes as a design feature, they could also have multiple holes. From mother of pearl to plastic, from wood and coconut shell to metal, from glass to ceramic, flat buttons are available in a wide array of materials. They are simplest for an artisan to make and hence artisanal buttons in ceramic, resin or wood are highly popular in designer wear garments. They can be printed, painted, stamped, engraved or even etched if they are made up of metal. Flat buttons are easy to attach by sewing. You can sew them using a fine yarn or a sewing thread and even embroider patterns based on the grid of holes that are available to you. Next category is that of shank buttons. These buttons 
look like a little hemisphere with a loop on the lower side. The shank is the stem of the but stem that the button sits on and it is used to attach the button to the fabric. Sometimes they are called half ball buttons. A lot of times shank buttons are encrusted with stones. The next category is that of stud buttons or jean buttons. Now mostly most of the times stud buttons are also commonly referred to as shank buttons. They are much like the shank buttons except that instead of a loop they have a pin which is attached to the fabric to secure the button in place. These are no sew buttons. They cannot be attached by hand. Instead, they require a machine with a button setting die that is meant for the exact shape, size and design of the button. The button setting machine presses both the top and the bottom components together thereby creating addition. This bond is strong and ensures that the button withstands a lot of wear and tear. The waistband button on your denim garments is an example of a start button. Press buttons like this can be used only on thick and sturdy fabrics. Start buttons and even shank buttons stand proud of the fabric which makes them an ideal choice for thick materials such as denim, thick tweeds and chunky hand knits. The next category of buttons that we are going to discuss are toggles. Long and skinny and often rounded. Toggles can be used as buttons in buttonholes or with a loop fastening. Oval beads, cylindrical beads can also be used as toggles. Their length lets them slip through the smaller holes than a similar round or square button. So they are considered to be a secure choice. They tend to be statement pieces and often made up of wood or metal and attached as a flat button would be. Some toggles have two holes in the center and they are considered as a two hole flat button during attachment. Some of them will only have a through and through hole like a metal bead. In that case they are sewn from end to end creating a small loop or a shank underneath the bead. Toggles can be found along with loop closure in tote bags and beach bags as well. In Indian wear, they are predominantly used in kurtas to lend a natural rustic look. The next category of buttons include snaps. These metal or plastic fasteners stack together with a pop. Hence the name. They are ideal for hidden fastenings and for the ones they wear closure needs to be fairly secure. They are designed not to be sewn into fabric but pressed into fabric. They have prongs at the end of the ring which can be folded to the fabric thereby tightly securing the fabric. Snaps can be magnetic as in the case of bags and purses or non-magnetic as you often see in shirts. They can also be used in small objects where tabs are required. Apart from all these traditional categories of buttons, items like round beads oval beads or pearls can also be used as buttons. While their size or shape makes them act like a toggle, they are daintier and add more ornamental value. Wooden rings, 
crocheted carbon rings and embroidered fabric buttons are also used to create interesting detailing. Apart from apparel and accessories, buttons can be used in jewellery as well. Apart from being used as a fastener in knotted bracelets and necklaces, buttons can also be used as a jewellery making component in creation of eclectic costume jewellery. Choosing the right button. Now that we have seen the different ways in which a button is classified, we will be able to choose buttons better. So how do you go about selecting the right button for your design? Firstly, decide whether you want your buttons to be functional or purely aesthetic. While looking at functionality, you have to consider the area that is available to you where you have the opening and therefore the number of buttons. For instance, a typical men's shirt has seven buttons arranged linearly down the center front. Knowing how big of an opening you have and how many buttons you require also helps you select the size that is the line size of the button. At this juncture you should also understand the look that you want to create. Do you want your button to blend in with a fabric and thereby creating a barely visible look that is required in formals? Do you want your button to stand out in a bold color? Say maybe a pop of red, pink and orange on a white shirt. Do you want your button to give a very ethnic look? Do you want your button to impart a rich look? Considering the look and feel of the final design is crucial in selecting the right button. You should also know if the apparel, accessory or jewellery is going to be cleaned that is washed with water. In that case you need to have buttons that withstand the wash be it water, soap or detergent that is used to clean them. While using materials which are not washable you have to specifically mention that in the care label. You would have seen Remarks like spot clean only on certain garments and accessories. This means that the product cannot be submerged in water. Also, some buttons are heat sensitive. Which means that when you use these buttons on products, they cannot be ironed. Lastly, you must also take into account the costing of your design while selecting the right button. While a handmade ceramic button might look beautiful, it is not suitable for a ready to wear garment that has been mass produced. The cost alone would triple or increase by four times or more depending upon the quality of the button and the artisan that it is sourced from. These are simply pointers that would help you in choosing the right button for your design. But the world of buttons is quite large and there is a lot of scope for experimentation. I would also take you through a button sheet or a line card and show you what are the different buttons that are available in the market? This, I hope, would provide more clarity on the buttons available and how they can be used.
I would now like to walk you through a line sheet of buttons or a button catalog. This is a typical button catalog where you can see buttons being mounted along with their style code number. Buttons have been arranged according to the order in which they have been designed. However, some manufacturers choose to do it based on line size, whereas other manufacturers can create the same design of buttons in various sizes. Now let me point you out to certain materials and designs. For instance, the buttons that you see over here, over here and over here, these all come into the category called the mother of pearl finish or shell buttons. Now remember that these are very different from the real mother of pearl buttons. Only the finish here is referred by that name. On the other hand, these are basic plastic buttons that you commonly see in almost ready to wear casual garments. Let me turn the page for you. Here we have an assortment of buttons. Some of them are basic plastic. Some of them have different finishes on them. For instance, this button here is created using an inlay technique. Whereas these buttons are printed. This is a printed shell button. Buttons such as this, a layer of fabric has been encased between two layers of resin, thereby creating a new fascinating texture. Now, if this button were to be simply printed, it would look as flat as this. But incorporating another layer of a material and then doming the top layer makes the button seem more three-dimensional. There are certain buttons such as this which have a rim. Here the rim is pronounced. Here the rim is very smooth. Even though they are called flat buttons, they are not necessarily flat. Now this is a flat button that almost functions like a toggle. These kind of buttons are primarily used as decorative features in footwear or sometimes even in bags. This particular one has been made up of plastic but the same kind of button can also be made up of wood. Take a look at the array of designs that are available. Some have been printed. Some have engraving or etching done on them. Some have words printed on them. Some have numbers printed on them. This shows that a button can be customized to create whatever look that you desire. Turning over, let me introduce you to few more buttons. These are actual mother of pearl buttons. Now, they might be different in finishes. This is a pearl white finish. You also get a dull grey finish. Other finishes include Tahitian pearl finish. While there are many buttons in the market called MOP buttons or mother of pearl buttons, not all of them are real. Many only use the name as a tag. They are often for mother of pearl buttons created using other materials to give the mother of pearl finish. You can also see buttons such as this, where the outer rim is of a different color than the inner layer. You can also see that it is domed and then a design has been engraved on top. You can also see a Mickey commemorative button here. Commemorative buttons have been used by big companies, corporations, even political parties. These are worn as symbols of affiliation. 
while this particular button has not been made by Disney. Wearing or using this button still pays homage to the brand that created Mickey Mouse. Moving on, let us look at other materials in buttons. Wood is a commonly used button material. It can be colored, dyed, painted or etched. A printed layer can also be applied on top. You also get them in several natural finishes. Wood buttons can also be stained. Now, like wood buttons, you can also get coconut shell buttons. These buttons here are made up of coconut shell. While this is a smoothly polished wooden button, this one is indeed rough. Wooden buttons such as this can also be ornamented. This button with a polky look is used in garments like sherwanis. However, this same button can be used as a component in jewelry making, in this case a pair of earrings. Talking about ornamental buttons, gota buttons are very common in India. Now, here the word button is actually a misnomer, for this is not used as a closure. The actual button is a ring snap that is fixed to the fabric and this gota button is simply sewn on top as an embellishment. While the snap button performs the actual function of the opening and closing. The gota on top looks pretty. Now I spoke about different line size of buttons. You can see that these are quite big and fancy. This is a four hole button whereas these two are two hole buttons. This has been hand painted and glazed. This has been printed. This has been printed as well. This has a concave shape to it, giving it more interest. Now, talking about buttons in terms of hole classification. Buttons like such as this, or here, fabric buttons, they are two hole. You saw a majority of buttons here that have four holes in them. Now, some buttons do not have holes on top, in such as this, this, have you ever wondered how to attach them? Now, buttons such as this will have a small loop like this at the back. This is sewn to the fabric. So even though this is a flat button, this kind of functionality makes it almost like a shank. The same concept is also applied to fabric buttons, where a metallic lid is used at the bottom to create the button. Now, when you are designing buttons such as this, it can be created using a variety of fabrics to add a lot of aesthetic value to your garment. This was also a button, a fabric button with the dosi embroidery that has been later converted into a finger ring. So you can see that buttons have functions not only as closures but ornamental elements too. Talking about ornamental jewelry, this is a ring where two buttons have been stacked on top of each other to create this ring. I also pointed this ring as an example in unit 1 of this course. Buttons such as this, which are your shank buttons, have loops at the back. Now they can be made up of molded plastic or the button can be gem encrusted like this in the front. Talking about shank and stud buttons. Now this is a stud button. You can see the stud at the back. Even though it is a jewel encrusted button, the machine die is being designed in such a way as to press the button to the fabric without harming the rhinestone in the front. These kind of buttons 
are commonly used in denim jackets and jeans. Now you can see that it has a metallic tube like this at the back and it is fixed on to the fabric using another pointed component from the back side of the fabric. Even though it has a gem here, this will not be damaged during setting because a special die is crafted for this attachment. Here is a similar start button where the back portion has already been inserted. Can you see that how it dances or moves? This is there to increase the functionality of the button while being used. So this makes sure that the button can go in that is slip into the buttonhole and out without being stiff because stiff buttons tend to break over time. This is a snap button with all its various counterparts. You can see that it has almost a prong like setting. The prong goes into the back side and holds the fabric firmly in place. While all of them are buttons, this particular one is actually a rivet. Even though it can be used as a start button, it is an ornamental rivet that can be hammered down, that is flattened. The material is such that it will not get harmed during this process. Moving on, the next type of finishing trim that I would like to discuss with you are stays. Stay is a material that is applied to the garment parts for strength or for reinforcement purposes. They also help maintain the shape. There are mainly three types of stays. Stay tapes. These are tapes that are used during sewing and hence come under sewing trims. Collar stays and special stays. Thin flexible collar stays may be superimposed on the front edge seam of collars as they are sewn. Other flexible plastic stays can be stitched through and the stay remains permanent attached to a collar. You can also use removable stays. Plastic stays can be inserted into casing and can be removed during washing or dry cleaning. This third category of stays comes under finishing trims. Special stays include boning and underwires. Boning refers to a piece of plastic or metal that gives lightweight support to your garments. It gives them structure and keeps them in shape. In the past, whale bone was used in the making of corsetry and hence the term boning came into place. These boning corsetries were very constrictive and often impaired the normal breathing, walking and physical activities of a woman. This would lead the woman to feel breathless while doing these activities, giving fruit to the common misconception that women are weak and they cannot do physical activities. But today, Boning is made up of a much more comfortable material. It's much more softer. A common installation method is to remove the boning from its casing. Edge stitch the casing to the fabric layer underneath and then reinsert the boning during the finishing stage. An alternative method is to make the channels or casing from the garment's fabric or the lining fabric and insert the boning at the finishing stage. The next component in stays is underwire. You must have heard the word underwire being used in reference to bras or brasiers. Underwire bras are extremely popular in the market as they provide 
full support to one's bus. Now, underwire is a thin, semicircular strip of rigid material that is fitted inside the brassiere. The wire may be made up of metal, plastic. It is also made up of resin these days. It is sewn into the underside of the bra under each cup. Underwire helps to lift, separate, shape and support the bus. The next category of finishing trims that we are looking at are cords and drawstrings. A drawstring is a string, cord, lace or rope that is used to draw together, that is gather or shorten fabric or some other soft material. Now, the ends of the drawstring may be tied to hold it in place. It is also simultaneously used to close an opening. Drawstring bags or portlies are extremely common in India. In the south of India, they are also called a surkupai. Surku referring to the gathers created when the drawstring is pulled. Drawstring closure is commonly found on skirts. Indian skirts such as ghagras and ghagris largely depend on drawstring for their closure. Foundation garments like in skirts or petticoats also have drawstring on them. Using a drawstring as a waist closure means that the size is adjustable. This also makes the design more inclusive as it could be worn higher on the waist or lower depending on the mood and the need of the person. A drawstring may be threaded through a hem or a casing that is a continuous tube of a material as in case of churidars and salvars. They can also be laced through holes which are lined with eyelets. Now this is a type of closure that you might see in some bags. It may also be laced through hoops that is attached to material. In the same way belt loops are a very flat wide drawstring can also become a belt. Drawstrings can also be used as belts on top of garments. For instance, you can tie a decorative rope around a loose shirt or a t-shirt creating a different silhouette and a look for you using that ensemble. Drawstrings are traditionally considered to be semi-permanent or temporary closures as compared to other closer closures that are fixed like buttons, hook and eye, snap or rivet which are permanently sewn. This means that a drawstring could be removed, cleaned, replaced at any particular time. With this we come to the end of the second module of the unit 2. As a conclusion, let us summarize the, the points that were discussed. This module works in continuation with module 1 of this unit where we looked at the classification of fashion trims into sewing, finishing and packaging trims. While module 1 focused on sewing trims, module 2 has focused on finishing trims. In this module, we have particularly focused on buttons. What are the classification of buttons? Types of buttons, their sizes, materials, designs, their history and we ended with how to choose the right button for your project. We also looked at several other finishing trims like hook and eye, stays, 
boning, rivets, eyelids, and grommets. I hope that this module would be particularly useful to you when you are analyzing how a garment or an accessory has been made. It would also help you choose the right trim to finish your product in such a way that it is not only aesthetically appealing but also practical and durable and yes most definitely valuable providing cost effective means to you as a designer and to the buyer as a consumer. In the upcoming unit we shall discuss the third classification of fashion trims which are packaging trims. Until then, I would like you to record all the discussions that we had in this module in your learning diary. When you create a trim sheet at the end of this unit, the knowledge regarding classification of trims, particularly the classification of buttons, would be extremely useful. Thank you. Fashion Accessories and Trims, Unit 2, Module 3, Packing Trims. In this course that consists of 5 units, we will discuss in detail the relevance of accessories, jewellery and trims in the fashion industry. This is Module 3 of the second unit, which is all about packing trims. In this unit, we will study trims that are used in the packing of apparel, accessories and jewellery. In module 1 of unit 1, we have seen an introduction into the basics of fashion trims and accessories. In the module 1 and module 2 of unit 2, we have discussed sewing and finishing trims in detail. In this module, we will attempt to understand the trims and accessories that are used in packaging. I will explain the need for packing accessories and why packaging is important. We will also list all the trims and accessories that are used in packaging. Moving on, let us first talk about what is packaging. Packaging, as you all know, could be bundling, wrapping, encasing or getting the product ready for transportation and sale. The definition is not very different in the fashion industry. Packaging in the fashion industry. Packaging at the outset entails making a product sale ready. At this stage, the garments, accessories, or jewellery that have been manufactured, audited, quality checked, are tagged, wrapped in protective covers, cushioned, packed in covers or boxes for transportation and sale. Promotional materials, visuals, decorative wrappers are added to make the package visually appealing. This increases customer satisfaction when they receive the product. In the ready-to-wear apparel industry, garments are polypacked, dozen-wise, color-wise, size-wise, bundled and packed together in cartons. The cartons are marked with labels containing details about the merchandise. This makes sure that inventory, warehousing, and logistics process go on smoothly. In this regard, I would also like to talk to you about custom packaging. While in the mass produced industry, packaging like poly bags and cartons are common and even advised to be followed. In the designer industry, custom packaging 
is what rules the roost. Designer products or handmade products which are produced in limited quantities are packed in innovative containers. They are often accompanied by personal notes, handwritten cards and sometimes even freebies to achieve high level of customer satisfaction. There is also a latest entry into the custom packaging segment. These are for promotional merchandise that have been given out by companies, brands, even movies for that matter, just as a part of their promotion and advertising campaign. You might have seen t-shirts being packed in tin boxes or headphones being packed in pizza-like containers. These packaging options are novel, unique, often one of a kind. They are designed by specific graphic designers and printmakers for a particular promotional event of a brand. This exclusivity makes them innovative and hence receive higher degree of customer satisfaction. On one hand, as we discuss exclusivity and designer packaging, we cannot ignore the sustainability issues in packaging. We now live in a world where there is too much of waste around us. Everybody is talking about making the products eco-friendly, organic, natural and sustainable. Large amounts of packaging is frowned upon as these straight away go into the landfill, adding to the problem. So sustainability issues in packaging is a very important aspect. As packaging is reduced, the range of scenarios under which the product loss occurs rise until the increase in product loss exceeds the savings from use of less packing material. Now take for instance this scenario. Imagine that you are placing an order online for a beautiful pair of shoes or a beautiful necklace, something that can be broken if not packed properly. You might be a person who is all for sustainability and eco-friendliness. But you will also expect your product to be packed properly when it reaches you. If your product gets sent to you without bubble wrap or styrofoam peanuts or any sort of cushioning material, there are high chances that it might get broken in transit. Then what happens to all these eco-friendly debates? I know that this is a devil's argument and I am arguing it from both sides. This is a topic that has to be debated extensively until we come up with a solution that is more satisfactory both to the eco-friendly consumer as well as to the producer to make sure that there is no product loss or there are very less chances of return due to product breakage. In this regard, many eco-friendly and sustainable brands are coming up with new materials, processes and innovative solutions for packing goods that will reduce wastage. I hope that soon we will come to a scenario where we are able to come up with innovative packaging that can be recycled, reused without contributing to the landfill. Moving on, let us look at uses of packaging. Packaging in the fashion industry has a number of functions. The first apparent function of packaging is protection. Packaging or the right type of packaging prevents breakage. That is, it offers mechanical or physical protection. It also prevents spoilage and keeps the product clean, thereby increasing shelf life. Imagine that a white shirt or a white t-shirt is stored without polybag packaging. 
it might be displayed in an AC showroom, but still it will accumulate dust, especially on the crease lines where the garment is folded and kept. As a customer, you might not be interested in buying a product with a dirt line on it. Right kind of protection also prevents tampering and theft. That is why today we have self-sealing covers. We have covers that are sealed with RFID stickers and tags. At a mall, you cannot walk out wearing a garment or having a shoe in your purse because the RFID sensors will immediately inform the security guards of the theft. The second most apparent function of packaging is promotion. It showcases your logo and thereby your branding and in extension your brand identity. Are you a brand that likes gloss and glitter? Is your collection very rustic? Is your collection all about techno aspects? All these moods, concepts and theories of your collection, your product and your brand can be wonderfully showcased if you choose the right type of packaging. Packaging also lists product features and benefits in the form of tags and labels. It can be used to convey promotional messages. For instance, buy two, get one free. These kind of messages are often printed on the package. The third important function of packaging is conveying information. As I mentioned in point number two, packaging can be used to list product features and benefits. In continuation, the tags can list product identification, that is the style code number. It can give you details of the content, the description of the products and the care method. You can see whether your t-shirt has been made up of cotton or viscose. You can check whether it was made in India or China or USA. You can check whether you need to wash it or tumble dry it or it is dry clean only. Packaging also gives you the contact information of the brand or designer. This is not just for complaint purposes. If you want to buy another product tomorrow, it is helpful in having the contact details of the brand. Also, packaging can be used to issue safety warnings. For instance, on poly bags, you can often see this message being printed. This bag is not a toy. This is required and it's a regulatory feature in many countries where children might be playing with poly bags and they might have respiratory problems because of it. The fourth point about packaging is that it helps in unitization and convenience. That is, packing your items in boxes or cartons or that of regular shapes makes it easier for product storage handling. It also helps in transport from producer to retailer. It is also very efficient as a point of sale display. Now take the case of perfumes. Many of us buy the perfume because we like the bottle, don't we? So this brings us to the fifth and final point, value addition. Value addition in terms of aesthetics. Is the packaging collectible? There have been times in the past where people have bought chocolate boxes because the tins looked beautiful. As I gave you the example of perfumes, many of us even buy shoes and bags because the packaging can be reused. So reusability of packaging is another very important factor. The aesthetics that I mentioned earlier helps in the sale process 
and it also brings in new sales. Packaging aesthetics can also add value to the mood of the collection. For instance, when you receive a velvet box that is topped with a satin ribbon, you know that it is a luxury product. When you receive a craft box with a raffia thread tie-up, you know that the brand believes in being eco-friendly and natural. When these values resonate with you as a customer, you tend to associate with the brand or designer more often, thereby contributing to more sales. I hope by now you would have examined these various important factors behind choosing and designing packaging. I now have an activity for you. I would like you to keep a check on the kind of products that you buy in the next month. Visit a supermarket. Look through the aisles to see the product that captivates your fancy. It does not have to be a fashion product. Look at the kind of materials that are being used. Look at the label. Are the contents clearly printed? How and where is the price mentioned? Is the packaging eco-friendly? Are there too many layers? Are, or is there just one layer that is required to keep your product safe? Now, do this exercise once again at a mall where you can visit fashion stores. Look at the kind of packaging that these brands and stores are offering. See if you can make out whether it is paper or plastic or foil. See if tissue paper is being used. Ask around, collect samples. The next time you buy a product, look carefully as you unbox it. You might come across these trims that I am going to describe in just a moment. Record all these findings in your learning diary. They would be very useful to you in your learning process. And the next time you are called upon to design or to select packaging trims, you can refer to these notes. List of trims used in packing. Packing trims are those trims that are used during the packaging of a finished garment, accessory or jewellery. These include items like tissue paper, pins, boxes, tags, etc. Promotional merchandise or visuals of how the product looks when worn or how it can be used comes under the category of packing trims. Here is a list of packing tags for you. Tape, stickers, support boards, barcode, tissue paper, hangers, butterfly, tags, stays and inserts, clips and staples, poly bags, pins, cartons and promotional merchandise. Trim categorization. The packing trims that we have seen as a list so far can be divided into three categories. The first category, trims attached to the product. The second, trims or items that enable the product to retain its shape. Third, trims that are used to physically wrap, pack or enclose the product. Now look, let us look at trims in each of these categories in detail. Trims attached to the product. The most important trim that is, can be attached to a product and used in packaging are hand tags. Hand tags are particularly designed to draw attention 
to the garments and are hung on the side of the garment or the accessory sometimes in the front of the button line or on the main zip so that customers can see them easily now hand tags such as this can be hung from a string or specialized thread can be used they usually show the brand name style number size price etc i'm going to now walk you through a variety of hand tags and tell you how they are important i have a few hand tags for you here this is a hand tag that also works as a wash care label now this is a double layered tag which means that it is a fold out this on the other hand is a tag that has multiple layers now here in this hand tag promotional features of the product are also conveyed for instance it talks about how the product is comfortable it talks about how the product is utilitarian it also talks about how the product is secure now these are not just the values of the product but the values of the brand and the company as well so even though it is just a hand tag it also serves the additional functions of brand identity creation and promotion now look at this tag over here it is very grungy and you can barely make out what is written now this is almost the opposite end of this tag so a design of a tag depends on the brand and the product and the designer who chooses to reveal or conceal and control the information that is being passed on to the customer now let us take a look at few more tags that are there in this trim sheet now this is a tag that comes attached with a ball chain tags can also be attached with plastic staples these are tags this is from marvel this is a tag from a kids wear garment so you can see that it is not your typical rectangle tag but cut in the shape of a flower in such cases die cuts are used now this is a tag that looks more handmade you can see it being printed with vintage flowers and it has got a smooth shiny texture to it it also comes with a satin ribbon and it is attached using a safety pin and it is not tied nor stapled nor sewn to the product but just pinned this on the other hand is a very different example of a hand tag again it has a grunge finish on it but it is printed on a piece of fabric that is then stuck on a piece of cardboard tags such as this can often be found on outerwear denim garments and jackets kids tags are often the most interesting you can see tags being cut in different shapes according to the character that they are based on you can also see thin tags like this which are very dainty and have a small hole sometimes multiple tags that is tags made up of multiple materials can be combined together and attached using the same plastic staple you can also see that tags can be embossed they can be etched they can be printed on fabric on paper sometimes even laminated even a piece of fabric can simply be used as a tag i'm going to walk you through more tags and patterns this particular tag you can see an eyelet being used this as we discussed in the previous unit is to enforce the hole that has been punched in the cardboard and this ensures the longevity of this tag you can also see other tags with just one comic character that is being printed at the bottom or tags that can also serve as bookmarks or greeting cards now sometimes tags come along with 
price stickers or barcode stickers such as this. Now this is not uncommon. In fact, it is more common than you think for brands to multitask their tags. For instance, if you have a long tag like this, the back side comes with a wash care label. This tag is being printed with enough vacant space so that a barcode sticker can be attached. Tags such as this are primarily promotional tags. Now these tags are long enough and they come again with space at the bottom. This space is for a price sticker or a barcode sticker to be attached. So now what are these price stickers and barcode stickers? Price stickers are stickers that show you the price of the product. You can see a few price stickers here. Now price stickers can be combined with other details. For instance, here you can see the color and the style code of the product. Here you can see the number of countries it is being sold in. Here you can see the size of the product. Here you can find the entire details of the company and the fact that it is made in India. So. Designing a price sticker by itself is an art. What does the manufacturer want to convey to the consumer and how efficiently they want to do it? So these can be either printed directly on the tag or they can be printed separately as a sticker and be stuck on the tag. This also depends upon the manufacturer and the kind of assembly line process they have at their workshop. Now, in case of designer brands, you will often see only one tag. Why? These tags are custom made for products in a very small number. Owing to these small quantities, it is wise to print all details on one tag in order to save costs. The next kind of trim that we are going to discuss today is a pocket flasher. Pocket flasher is somewhat an unusual trim often found only in denim garments, particularly jeans. It is a printed card for branding and communication that is pinned in or inserted to the back pocket of denim jeans and trousers. The next category of trims that we would be looking at is a size strip. Size strip mentions the size of the product. Now, if you take a product like leggings or t-shirts, this is a strip that has been stuck on the net. Some com customers also complain that the strips do not come off easily and leave a white stain as and when you wash them. Now this depends upon the adhesive that is used in the sticker. There are also certain stickers where the size is printed onto a paper tag and then that is attached to the main hand tag. Size strips are often used when it is printed in a roll and the garment or the product is also three dimensional or can be stacked as a roll or as a block or as a stack. The size strip often goes around the product and hence the word strip is being used rather than a sticker. Even though display cards are not directly attached to the product, they are used to display the product. For instance, earring tags such as this or display cards that could come with necklaces are very useful because they enable easy transport, easy storage of the pieces and not only that, they can be displayed. If you walk into a multi-branded outlet and see the accessory section, you will often see tags such as this, earrings hanging on to metal rods. These help the customer in easily taking out a product, looking at it 
and putting it back right there on the road. Often, price stickers and barcodes are stuck to the back of this label. They do this to make sure that the branding in the front is not hidden. The second category of trims are those that enable the product to retain its shape. Boards and backing. Cardboard and foam back boards are used to impart shape and support to the garment being folded and packed. Sponge is also used to cushion expensive products that get damaged easily. A good example of a backing board is what you will find in a shirt packing. Clips and stays. Clips and stays such as this help hold the folded garment in place. In a flat packed item like men's shirts, clips are used to hold together the sleeve cuff with the shirt or the front and back of the shirt to the backing board. Collar stays are bits of plastic material that are inserted along the collar band to hold up the collar. Small items called butterfly is often used as a collar stay here. They are usually made up of thin but rigid plastic sheet. You cannot create a packaging without some sort of adhesive, so tapes are important. But in cases where the adhesive in the tape will leave a mark on the garment, pins and tags are used. Metal pins such as bell pins or ball pins are used to secure layers of a folded garment together. These unfortunately cannot be used in materials such as leather or UV coated fabrics because they tend to leave a hole. Third category of trims are those that are used to physically wrap, pack or enclose a product. First up in this category is tissue paper. Thin glazed machine roll paper that is printed or plain is used to pack high value products. The tissue could be a pop of solid color that goes with the branding of the brand or it could be printed with a brand logo for additional branding. Styrofoam peanuts, common loose fill packaging and cushioning material that is used to prevent damage to fragile items while shipping. Styrofoam peanuts are not very common in India, but they can be found in almost all packages coming from US and UK. Bubble wrap. Bubble wrap refers to a pliable, transparent plastic material used for packing fragile items. Protruding air-filled hemispheres that are regularly spaced provide cushioning for fragile items. Bubble wrap is one of the most commonly used packaging items in India in the fashion industry. Jewelry, bags and small accessories like purses, pouches, even eyewear is wrapped using bubble wrap. A lot of our logistic covers, transport covers come lined with a layer of bubble wrap for easy transportation. The next trim that we are going to discuss is a hanger. A hanger as you all know is a piece of plastic, wooden or metal object that is used to not just transport an item of clothing but also display it at the point of sale. Now, depending on the brand and the product, hangers can be customized. They can be covered with fabric such as velvet. They can be etched or engraved 
if they are metal or wood hanger sizer is a small label that is attached with the hanger clip and it is used for identifying the garment size it is detachable and quite useful as a visual merchandising tool when products such as trousers are arranged in a hanger display the next trim that we are going to discuss are poly bags a poly bag is a plastic packet or a pouch that is used to pack merchandise so that it remains intact without collecting dust dirt or moisture most bags that are used in the garment industry are made up of pp that is polypropylene or pe polyethylene and sometimes the recyclable ldpe that is low density polyethylene these bags can be plain or they can be printed with a branding a lot of them come with a warning saying this bag is not a toy these kind of bags are called self sealing pouches because they come with an adhesive sticker bags such as this called ziploc bags are also used particularly for smaller items they come in all sizes starting from 2 by 3 inches now the choice of using a ziploc that is a lock bag or a self sealing bag depends again on the company the designer and the kind of product that is being packed in them moving on not all brands like using plastic in their packaging they prefer to use drawstring bags or pouches in cases of items like shoes or jewelry the product is packed in a cloth bag these products are typically handed to the customer over the counter and not shipped thus the rigidity that is required in transportation packaging is not required here we can now move on to boxes cases and cartons boxes of plastic tin or paper are used to encase wrapped objects this is useful in storage and display of products for sale for instance a watch case boxes used in display such as this are more ornamental they could be printed trimmed embellished or embossed now in case of this box you can see that there is a transparent layer in the center this is useful as a display box but when you also send it to the customer the customer can look at the product inside without having to open the box this saves time and energy at the point of sale and adds the ah factor or the wow factor during and after purchase initially i spoke to you about custom packaging this is one such example this is a palm leaf pouch that is used to transport and package small items like jewelry or watches this is another example of custom packaging is in the packaging itself as beautiful as the final object this is a porcelain box that is being wrapped and knotted with a banana fiber ribbon there is also a small tag that carries the branding this is packaging for a scent products such as this in the fashion industry help convert the intangible nature of the fashionable product into a tangible product that can be seen bought admired and used in case of mass produced fashion items fashion products once individually packed are packed once again in cartons for easy shipment the size 
and the thickness of the box depends on the product that is being packaged and its material. These cartons are labeled once again with barcode stickers and information stickers that help point out the items that are there in the cartons. Before individual items go inside boxes, corrugated sheets such as this are used to encase the product. Sometimes even boxes made up of corrugated cardboard are used. This ensure the safety and the security of the products that are being packed and shipped. Finally, we come to the last category of promotional merchandise. In terms of custom packaging, the packaging itself performs the promotional function. But in the true nature of packaging trims in the fashion industry, promotional materials refer to the additional items or content that is delivered with the main product. This is not to be confused with add-ons or freebies that are bundled together with the main product. Trims under this category are lookbook cards or catalogs, style cards and more information regarding the company, the product or the material. Sometimes brochures, gift cards, coupons or cards such as this talking about a particular wash of a product or small paper bags such as this filled with an extra button or a tag or a gift coupon or a complimentary poster or all part of the communication that is created by the brand. With this, we come to an end of this module. To summarize the items that have been discussed, we took a look at what packaging means. What are the uses of packaging? We debated upon whether packaging is only for protection or can it be used to add value to the product that is being sold. We then moved on to various packing trims that are used in the fashion industry, be it the packaging of apparel, accessories or jewellery. We looked at categorizing trims into trims that are attached to the product, trims that are used to encase the product and trims that are used to actually keep the product in its shape. We also looked at custom packaging and promotional materials that can be used in packaging. I hope that this module would have provided you clarity on the different types of packing trims that are used in the industry. As we come to the end of this module, we've also come to the end of our discussion on the three types of fashion trims that are used in manufacturing of a fashion product. We have discussed sewing trims, finishing trims, and packaging trims. In the next module, we will discuss decorative trims and patches. Thank you.